Well, good evening, family and friends. I'm Minister John Pickens, and I would like to thank you all for joining me on this Thursday evening for the word of God today. Amen. I have to begin by giving honor to God and my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for saving me from my sins and commissioning me to preach his word to his people all around the world. Amen. Let us remember today uh, to pray and to keep our hearts, uh, minds, and thoughts on those who are in the aftermath of Hurricane Ian and Hurricane Fiona and any other natural or man-made disaster around the world. Amen. Now, tonight's scripture and text will be coming again from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I will begin at verse 11. Putting away childish things. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. And now abide in faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. May the Lord bless both the hearers and the doers of his word. Amen. Let us all pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come before you today, Lord Jesus, thanking you, thanking you, Heavenly Father, for protecting us, Lord, as we are soon closing out another work week. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for seeing forth to bring us life this day, for protecting us from another long day, Heavenly Father. We just ask today, Lord, for forgiveness of all of our sins today. We pray, Lord, that you continuously cleanse us from the crowns of our heads to the soles of our feet. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for everyone that is listening, every man, woman, and child, Lord, that is listening to this message. We pray uh, and decree over them uh, safety and protection in Jesus' name. We pray, Heavenly Father, an overflow of blessing for them in, in, the, in the name of Jesus Christ. And we want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for your bread of life today. We pray, Heavenly Father, that your bread flow, your words flow through my mouth, Heavenly Father, to accomplish that which, which you have spoken into my mouth uh, to all of our lives today. So we thank you today, Lord, for this a time of fellowship. We thank you today, Lord, for this word of God. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray today. Amen, amen, and amen. Thank you all again, brothers and sisters, for joining me for this evening's word of God. Amen. Now let us take our minds off of everything and everyone and let us place it on Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I'd like to speak with you again a few moments today in continuation of our message of love, but today's focus will be on putting away childish things. Amen. Now, again, the background and uh, text for our scripture concerns a very important biblical figure, the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul, again, is credited with writing over two thirds of New Testament with many of his letters or epistles uh, credited going directly to the church. Uh, now, Paul or his name as Saul or as it originally was places him as a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, Paul grew up within the Jewish religion and he became a very well educated scholar. Um, to his eventual appointing of a Pharisee. Um, Pharisees were appointed as uh, the ultimate authority on the Mosaic Code of any and everything concerning the law. Um, they judged, they were the judge, juries, and executioners of anyone who was or was not in compliance with the law. Now, after the death of Christ, uh, Paul would find himself in the middle of a large uh, mass persecution of all the new believers, of all the new believers in Christ. Paul would become one of those who would be oppressing them. Uh, during this uh, persecution, Paul would go to oversee the deaths of many uh, early believers in faith, including this one individual we all know by the name of Stephen. Uh, he personally oversaw the stoning of Stephen as Stephen was prophesying and preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, one particular day as Paul was continuing to serve letters of persecution, he was on his way to the city of Damascus. On the road to Damascus, he was struck by a blinding light this blinding light being Jesus Christ, amen. As Jesus spoke out to Paul, 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 why are you persecuting me, amen. Uh, and as we know from that forward, Paul's uh, life would never be the same, amen. He would go into a village where he would soon find another believer who would make contact with him, and that is where his ministry uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ would begin. Now, today we're talking specifically about another letter that he wrote uh, to the people of Corinthians, amen. Now, here we're going to focus on love, but more specifically, we're going to focus on putting away childish things, amen. Now, for our childhood, and we all have had one, we all remember growing up. Um, oftentimes, the memories of childhood, they either bring back uh, memories of good uh, feelings or bad feelings or both. Um, now, nonetheless, childhood was, again, a very important time in all of our lives. It was a time of learning, 
It was a time of risk taking, um, a time of arguments as well. It was a time of arguments over very petty and small things. Now, some of the things that we argued over um, as children were toys. We all argued over toys or who was going to get the seat in the front seat of the car, who was going to get the biggest cup of juice to drink, um, who had more friends, who had better friends, who had better looking clothing. Um, and yes, who was better, the boys versus the girls. Now, again, today's message, again, is not to point fingers at anyone, uh, because all of us at some point in all of our childhoods, uh, we have all engaged in these types of arguments. So again, none of us have room to throw a cast stones at anyone. Um, you see, as children, um, we are in our most primal states of mind. We are. Like, when we're all young, that is when we think most irrationally. That is when we're thinking only about uh, ourselves. Amen. And as we learn, uh, we learn many different ways. One way and specifically, we learn by observation. Uh, we learn by absorption, or really, you could say through osmosis. We absorb, as children, we absorb any and everything that is around us, whether it is good or whether it is bad. Amen. Now, much of this information that we're absorbing, it comes from our parents, but oftentimes it may come from brothers and sisters. It may come from friends. It may come from the internet. I mean, it's some things that we see on television or in our news media, uh, printed media. Um, either way, the main idea here is that in childhood, we learn uh, by absorbing and consuming as much information as possible. Um, again, childhood, this is where we begin to form our first opinions on race, our first opinions on gender, um, how to treat the other gender. Um, how about uh, adolescence? This is where our adolescence age stage takes place, with this, with, which is in our childhood. Um, this is where we learn about good versus evil for the first time and right versus wrong. And most importantly, this is where we begin to form our first opinions and views on God. Amen. Now, um, as our childhood years are extremely important for us to have a strong foundation, so to have information imparted on, onto us from day one. That is why it's very important for children and men to have strong parents or guardians in their lives, because these are some of the most important years of your learning maturation process. Um, as we know, childhood is also where we maintain the minimum account of accountability and responsibility that we could ever have. Yes, many of us, we grew up working as children, but we still did not have the same level of responsibility as we do as adults. Um, again, as ch children generally, we're not responsible for paying bills. You may have chores to do, uh, but you're still not responsible for balancing the family's checkbook, their finances, nor are you responsible for working eight plus hours a day, 40, 60, 80 hours a week, nor are you responsible for running a business. Again, you may run a lemonade stand or some sort of school fundraiser, but you're still not responsible ultimately for running a full scale business. Now, instead, a child uh, may be responsible for other things like I just mentioned, uh, washing clothes, uh, folding your clothing, doing yard work both inside the house and outside the house to include washing dishes, lawn work, et cetera, completing your homework. That is another very important task that children must do. Um, to going to church on a Sunday is to making sure you're ready for church and Sunday school. Now, many of our parents, as we know, they worked out in the fields after school for very long hours. Uh, they worked uh, much more than today's generation, um, and they were required to work back in those days. But nonetheless, they still had a similar level of responsibility uh, in, in that they were not ultimately responsible like their parents were for making sure everything was run a certain way. In other words, there's just a big difference between the responsibility that is placed on children and that which is what is placed on adults. Now, I say generally because we know there are some who've had families where maybe due to the death, unfortunate death of a particular brother, sister, mom or dad, uh, that child had to accept large levels of responsibility that would be similar to that with adults. Uh, we know that is always uh, the case uh, in some instances or a child that has been tasked with taking care of a sick parent. But instead, generally, we're talking about most children. Most children don't have that level of responsibility. Amen. When they are children, they are indeed children. Now, again, in the end, regardless of what type of childhood you've had, regardless um, of the type of arguments that you have uh, to engage in, we all have to begin the next stage of life, which is the maturation process. Yes, the maturation process, the process of growing up. Verse 11 says again, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. Now, we've all heard uh, and know the stories of our some of our favorite childhood cartoons or fairy tales, such as Peter Pan and Pinocchio. Uh, these two specifically were uh, two of my favorite because they focused on the essence of being a child. Uh, one story, particularly Peter Pan, was the essence of being a child because it 
promise you that you could stay a child forever uh, without, so in other words, avoiding the consequences of growing up. And the other focused on actually becoming a real boy. In other words, becoming more of a real person, more of an adult type figure. And so both of those films are very, very interesting because they have very important lessons to impart. However, uh, we have to understand something. In today's time, as we go through this maturation process, some experts say this occurs around the age 12, some 13, some 14, some even later in life. However, instead of um, evolving out of who gets the biggest cup of juice or who has the best favorite color or whose color is better or who's better, the boys versus the girls, uh, we need to continue to mature, brothers and sisters. We need to continue to mature into adulthood. You see, Paul says here that when I was a child, I spoke as a child. So brothers and sisters, as children, we speak on impulse. When you're very young, you speak on emotion. You speak without filter. You just have to let everyone know what your point of view is. Now, these may be seen, these, they may seem to be admirable qualities even for adults, but uh, when children do this, they have no understanding of the power of the tongue. They're children. Uh, children, again, have no understanding or very little understanding that everything we say can and will be used against you at some point, not only in the court of law, but in the court of public opinion, and yes, in the courts of life. Amen. Uh, so we must understand that our words do have consequences. Now, Paul stresses here that speaking as a child should occur again when you are a child. Uh, we are not here uh, about talking about simple levels of vocabulary, but rather the substance. What are the words that you are saying? What are your intended meaning? Who and where are these words targeted from? And two, uh, again, this goes to the part, of, this goes to the next scripture. Um, I understood as a child. Now, as we all know to this day, um, this day and age, children can operate uh, cell phones. There's not many children who don't know how to operate a cell phone or deal with social media or the internet in general. Um, it's almost as if they are all born knowing how to do certain things. But for some reason, children still have issues discerning right from wrong. Now, think about this for a minute. They can operate computers. They can operate cell phones and social media pages. They can often run circles around their own teachers or parents. But for some reason, they still have issues determining right from wrong. Very interesting. You're sure these are things that adults struggle with. Uh, amen. So we may assume that children uh, are to, how do we know, or how do we to assume that children are automatically supposed to know right from wrong when adults struggle from right from wrong? They have to be taught. Amen. Just because they're uh, talented in terms of cell phones or they may ace all of their AP exams, that does not mean that they know right from wrong. Amen. Now, sometimes, uh, again, there's a big difference uh, between uh, the wisdom of the world, amen, and the wisdom of God. Amen. There's a big difference, brothers and sisters. Just because you may be smart in one area does not mean that we have it all in the other. So we cannot expect our children to automatically know all the inner inner and operation, the inner workings and the operations of this world. So again, operating a cell phone uh, to a fault, to a T, does not equate to operation, let's say, in a marriage. Uh, you know, coming home with straight A's in your AP classes or your IB classes does not equate to being ready to lead a household. Uh, simply put, being a man or a woman does not mean you're automatically ready to be a father or a mother, much less a husband or a wife. Again, one can be good at making money, uh, but that does not mean that you're going to be good at also keeping the peace, much less spending the money. So children think this way. Children think that, hey, I'm good at this, so I'm going to be good at that. Okay, the scripture says, again, I thought as a child. So the way that children think and understand the world, they understand the world through generalizations, uh, through broad context. Uh, they speak in absolutes all of the time. You know, uh, they equate being good at one thing, again, as I just mentioned, with being good at another. Or they equate being uh, book smart uh, with being street smart. It's not the same thing. They equate worldly wisdom with godly wisdom. Okay, just because you have a 4.0 GPA does not mean you have a 4.0 spiritual GPA. Amen. And who's going to be the determiner of that? Only the most high. Not any of us, only him. And he's telling us we have all fallen short of his glory. Amen. The Bible does say this generation will be weaker and wiser. But meaning wiser, meaning the things of the world not wiser in the things of God. Amen. In fact, they're going to be weaker in the things of God, which means they have to be taught. We cannot automatically assume our children do not need teachers. Amen. Teachers of the word. Now, uh, but what good does it a profit a man, as the word says, to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Children in their right minds, they're, they're, ide they're, they're ideologists or they're, they're idealists rather by nature. 
Um, life teaches them to be realists and pragmatists. So when you're starting out very young, you're an idealist. Um, you're always looking for the good and hoping for the best and everything. But as you grow older, you end up realizing um, life teaches you again to be a realist, to be a pragmatist. Uh, now, unfortunately, as adults, we too, at many times, um, have not begun this process of putting away childish things or childish thought processes. Now, you might be saying, well, Brother John, didn't Jesus say um, that we need to be as little children when we seek him? Yes, indeed, Jesus did say, uh, say this, brothers and sisters, but in context, what he was referring to was faith. Amen. Children are idealists, which means they are optimists by their very nature. So the Lord wants us to be in a similar way as it pertains to having faith in him. He wants us to always have faith in him. Amen. Always be of great expectations of the Lord. So he wants us to be uh, have the faith of a child, but he does not want us to have the reasoning ability of a child. Amen. Now, many of us are still on the playground. So you see having faith of the child uh, as, as it pertains to the things of God is very different. Amen. Than having the thought and reasoning process of a child. Amen. If we have the thought and reasoning ability of a child, we will stay on the playground. Amen. And the longer we stay on the playground as adults, makes us more likely to have and maintain an idle mind. And as we know in the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, verse 27, it is very clear. Uh, this is the New Living Bible translation, but it still says, idle hands is the devil's workshop. Amen. This also equates to having an idle mind also being the devil's workshop. So the same activity engaged in as a child, it may be permissible as a child. When you become an adult, amen, it is going to bring a certain level of accountability now. Okay. Now the scripture in verse 11 tells us again, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now we will often see texts refer to men, but many of these same texts can also be referred to women. In other words, many of these texts are also gender neutral. So this text says, but when I became a man, or it can be replaced as I became a woman, a man. Now, this is uh, some of the most dreaded part of growing up, which is realizing that the things that we've done or used to do as children, we can no longer do the same things as adults and reap the same results. Now, to be clear, accepting this truth, um, accepting this reality is not easy. It takes us in our entire lifetime to not just the front 20 years to 30, 40, 50. It takes us our entire lives to realize this, brothers and sisters. And why is that? Because this is not only where our natural bodies are making a transition. This is also where our inner man, our inner woman, our spiritual uh, nature also begins to mature. So you see our spirits also grow through a maturation process, regardless of your personal religion, regardless of your denomination or your political beliefs. All of our physical bodies go through this growth, but also our spiritual bodies do as well. Now, in order to cope with these new changes, uh, some of us, we accept the biblical view of the world as the explanation for the condition of mankind, while many others, we don't want to do that. We want to accept our own worldview, amen, or another version. Uh, for the word of God uh, does say people uh, will do what they think is right in their own eyes, amen. Now, doing what we want to do as children, amen, that's all fine and dandy because there's very few consequences. However, brothers and sisters, as we grow, we must understand that putting away childish things means that we must also put away childish thought processes, amen, childish thoughts, amen. Uh, and this begins the process of the word that many of us dread, which is called accountability. Accountability is very important. Um, again, this is gender neutral. Uh, this is age neutral. This is uh, political party neutral. This is uh, religion neutral. Amen. We all must face some level of accountability in life if we are to be considered adults. Now, regardless, uh, regardless of your beliefs, again, being a man, being an adult man or an adult female means we must learn to accept a man and face this process called accountability. Now, notice the emphasis that is placed on personal accountability, not peer-based accountability. Now, we must focus our, on ourselves, brothers and sisters. It is much easier to hold someone else in account for what they are doing or not doing than it is to hold ourselves. Amen. The Lord tells us to evaluate ourselves. Again, Romans 2 and 6 says, God will repay each of us according to his own works. You're not going to be paying for your brothers and sisters' works. You're not going to be paying for the other political party or the other religions works. You're only going to be paying for your own works, brothers and sisters. So, amen. So uh, while we are busy trying to hold everyone else accountable, other genders accountable, um, other religions accountable, other political parties, we must start with ourselves. The word of God tells us very clearly, let a man examine himself 
And judge not, for the way you judge another man is the way you will also be judged. So a very large part of growing up and putting away childish things is to acknowledge. We need to come to a simple acknowledgement that as adults, we have more power and responsibility and accountability than that of a child. Now, to whom much is given, much is required. Or as the popular way, as are some of our movies reference today, um, with great power comes great responsibility and accountability. Amen. Now, uh, what stops us from having this accountability, what stops us from taking responsibility is the temptations that we face in this world. Amen. Now, as mentioned before, um, part of the process of ascending into adulthood is uh, that we must understand that it's going to be riddled. It is going to be riddled with various temptations and challenges along the way. Uh, before Jesus took his ministry, uh, while he was in the desert, he was tempted three separate times on separate occasions. Uh, this account takes place in uh, three of the Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, whichever version you read, as the enemy, we have to pay attention to how he is speaking to the Lord. Um, he speaks to Jesus using, using conditional statements such as if and then. Very important words, very important terminology. He says, if you are the son of God then you should turn this stone into bread. Now, or if you bow your head down and worship me, if you bow down and worship me, then I will give you the kingdoms of this world. You see, the if parts of the conditional statements are meant to challenge you. Uh, they're meant to trick you. They're, they're meant to see whether or not you are on your purpose. Amen. The enemy will challenge you. The enemy will challenge you to see if you are truly who you say you are or rather who you really believe yourself to be. Again, he tempted the Lord on three separate occasions. Uh, first, by the way of food, uh, by the way of divinity, he wanted to test his God nature and by uh, taking unnecessary risks and by way of power, influence, and wealth. So the first temptation was by way of food. Yes, he was in the desert for 40 days. Of course, he was hungry. He wanted food. So he told him to look at the stone. If you are the son of God, then you go ahead and turn this stone into bread. Amen. He does that with us all the time. Amen. If you are a Christian and you want to be married, take that woman over there and go make her your wife. Or if you are a man or woman of God, just go ahead and take that, that husband over there to go take that car that does not belong to you and make it yours. Amen. The enemy is still using the same temptations today. Uh, the second temptation, he tested the divinity of the Lord. He told him to go jump off the cliff. Amen. The angels are going to catch you. Amen. They're going to catch you and keep you from uh, gashing your foot against the stone. Amen. And lastly, he test tested them by way of power, influence and wealth. If you are the son of God, if you are a Christian man or woman, why don't you go ahead and make as much money as you want in this world? After all, no one knows how long we have to live. So the enemy is still using the same temptations against us today, brothers and sisters. And as we grow, he will use that same phraseology on all of us. As I just mentioned, if you are a real man, then you will be able to do this. If you are a real, real woman, why don't you go ahead and do this? If you are, are a real Christian, if you are a believer in Christ, why don't you go ahead and work these miracles? If you want to be a wealthy and wise man, then why don't you go do this? You can be like a celebrity. You can be like a famous person. Amen. He's doing the same tricks today, brothers and sisters. So how did Jesus deal with these temptations? How did he deal with this in his maturation process in the desert? Well, let us see. He utilized the word of God. Amen. The sword of the spirit. Amen. He would always retort the enemy with, it is written. Amen. You shall worship the Lord thy God and him only. Amen. We must do the same, brothers and sisters. When we are tempted by the world, when we are tempted by the enemy, and when we tempt ourselves, because you can tempt yourself, we must always use the word of God. Amen. Use the word of God, because this is not only his truth, this is the truth. Amen. This is the real fact checker. We don't need to go to an online website to, fact, uh, to, to check the facts. Amen. Use the word of God. You see, um, our own manifestation of what we believe is right and wrong, this will leave us squarely vulnerable to the enemy. So you are free to live your truth, but keep in mind in doing so, you are going to be playing right into the hands of the enemy because he is going to test you to see if you say you are who you say you are. Amen. And if you are, then he's going to try to get you to do something without seeking the most high first. You see, the same thing occurred in heaven a long time ago. The book of Revelations chapter 12 states very clearly that there was a war, brothers and sisters, there was a war in heaven. And the devil and a third of his angels were cast down in rebellion because they were over trying to overtake 
heaven. Now, the same process is continuously underway right now in our own households, amen, and in our communities, in our nation, and in our world, amen. There is rebellion afoot, the same temptations, the same deceptions, the same subterfuge used by the enemy in the garden. Uh, it was also used against Jesus in the desert, and now it is being used against all of us in our households and our very bodies today, amen. You, they're used to tricks, there were tricks they were being used to get people to be cast down from the presence of God. Amen. And it worked for a third of them. Amen. And now the enemy seeks to do the same to us in our households. Well, brothers and sisters, do not let the tricks of the enemy uh, succeed. Amen. Do not let the enemy trick us into believing that we can stay children forever, that we can continue to entertain childish debates over who's better than men or the women, over who, over which denomination is better over who's right or which wrong, which political party is best, amen. At some point, we must all uh, go through not only the natural maturation process, but we must also go through the spiritual maturation process, which uh, takes place, we must, and the only way that is going to take place, brothers and sisters, is to have and accept a relationship with Jesus Christ, amen. This message is not about a religion. This message is not about to get you to convert uh, to Catholicism or Judaism or to any other faith. This is about us to getting us to understand that we need a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, one day we will see the full picture. Amen. Verse 12 says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Paul is saying here that as we examine ourselves, we are only able to see things um, a certain way. But one day we will be able to see things face to face, or in other words, we will be able to see the full picture. Amen. The full will of God in all of our lives one day. Now, in other words, um, again, as we begin to grow from children to adults, we will begin to see much more of the forest and not just the trees. Now, keep this in mind. This chapter is addressing love as the greatest gift, as we have been discussing here in this chapter. Uh, but in order to have that, we must begin the process of putting away childish things. A child is not able to love a man as you are, as you begin to understand what love truly means. Um, it is almost as if the scriptures are implying that until you put away childishness, you won't be able to truly enact the greatest gift, nor see the fuller picture as you grow. Sure, is a child capable of love? Absolutely. But children do not understand the fullness, amen, as uh, the Lord wants us to as adults, amen, in terms of agape love, amen, in terms of giving oneself and all that we do, amen, for each other. Now, it's almost as if the scriptures are implying that until your childishness, until you put away your childishness, again, we won't be able to fully enact and embrace love as he calls us to embrace. You see, all living organisms were made to grow. Everything that was created, he, he created it to grow, to mature, to manifest, to manifest for the purposes of God. Amen. Now, what good does a tree do you that if it met, never makes it past its seedling stage? Uh, what good is a bird if it never hatches from the egg? Uh, or if it never makes it past the fledgling stage, that of, is of a young chick. What good is a fruit? What good is a piece of fruit that never ripens? And so what good are we uh, are as people if we never make it past childhood, brothers and sisters? What good are we if we never make it past our adolescent years? The book of Matthew chapter 7, verse 19 says, Every tree that bringeth not good fruit is cut down and cast down into the fire. Amen. When we refuse to mature, uh, we are like a tree not bringing forth good fruit, or even worse, we become weeds or viruses or parasites or harmful bacteria, which only take and consume from their environment. Or is that what we are doing, brothers and sisters, as adults? Are we only consuming or waiting for others to pour into us? Amen. Now, the scripture also goes on to say, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. So again, uh, we, we only know some things right now. Uh, because we're all young, we're still maturing. But despite all of the knowledge and the degrees and the wisdom and intellect that you can have or have right now, this all pales into uh, in comparison to what is to come. Amen. However, one day it will all be made clear to all of us, to every single man, woman, and child on this planet. It will all become very clear one day that we all need to begin the process of putting away childish things and why and in doing so that will lead us to ultimately loving now, the inspiration uh, of Jesus Christ, one of the inspirations is that we all need to contribute and that we all can contribute, regardless of where you are financially, regardless of where you are in life. We all can contribute something in this world, something positive. Uh, Jesus, he inspires all of us. Again, he inspires all of us to contribute, if anything, in love. Um, amen. You may not be able to preach to millions of people. You may not be able to lay hands and bring people back from the dead. You may not be able to speak in tongues or, or, or dance or do any of these other things, but we all can love. 
Amen. Now, although the gospel started with imparting uh, or being imparted first into the Jewish people, Jesus' ultimate plan was for all of us to be able to sit at his table. Amen. His plan was for all of us one day to be able to partake in the tree of life, in the bread of life. Amen. He commanded the disciples before he ascended into heaven to preach the gospel to every living creature and throughout all of Judea and throughout the entire world. Amen. That is the mandate for all of us, brothers and sisters. Amen. He meant for all of us at some point or another to preach, uh, maybe not in a pulpit, but we preach through our life, our own life's experiences. Amen. Because someone is always watching us, whether you like it or not, we are all role models in some form or fashion. And what he also meant for us is to love. Amen. You can preach through loving. Amen. Loving is a form of ministry. Amen. So love is for all of us, regardless of your level of intellect, regardless of your levels of education or finances. Loving is for all of us. Amen. Jesus inspires all of us to be better versions of ourselves. But he also inspires us to produce. Amen. Don't just be better. Let's do better. Amen. He calls each of us not to simply produce money and wealth and fame and, and resources and notoriety. Again, nothing wrong with those things. But ultimately, he calls all of us to produce the greatest gift of all. And that is love. Amen. The two commandments that he stresses more than all the rest also talk about the greatest gifts. Amen. First of all, he tells us to love the Lord thine heart with all thy mind, all thy heart, all in all of thy soul. Amen. And love thy neighbor as thyself. Amen. Those are the two commandments with promise. Amen. So putting away childish things means we also need to understand that life is not simply about acquiring things. It's not simply about acquisitions. Amen. The Lord says a man's worth is not contained within the things that he or she possesses. So regardless of what you see on TV, regardless of what you hear, regardless of what you tell yourself, your self-worth, he is not looking at you based upon how much wealth that you've acquired in this world. Amen. In this particular scripture, that night, that rich man who was wondering this, his soul was required of him. As he was planning on building bigger barns to keep more in all of his money, amen, his soul was required of them that particular night. So this was a warning to all of us. Do not falsely place, amen, our uh, hope and faith in all of our riches, amen, as we see with these hurricanes, with these natural disasters. All of this can change in a matter of moments, amen. Now, all of us, to some degree, we all wish and want to be better off financially, financial independence, amen, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we do not necessarily want to always have to rely on someone to pay all of our bills, all of our basic finances. Um, now, this is not to say that we will never need anyone because you're always going to be in a position, brothers and sisters, where you're going to need someone, some help at some point in time in your life. But rather, financial independence means for most of us, we want to be able to have more control. We want to have more control over our finances, over our financial future. Amen. Now, the ironic thing about being financially independent is the more we become financially um, independent, we become dependent upon the things of the world. Amen. In other words, if we're not careful, you will free yourself from one form of bondage by relying on someone else. But now you, be, you become enslaved to another master or pharaoh, and that is materialism. That is selfishness. That is narcissism. Amen. That's the other side of being independent of finances. It means you're now going to be so dependent upon what your stock holdings say you're going to be so dependent of where your shares of the marketplace is, how many properties you have, how many zeros in your, your bank accounts. You're now going to go from one slave master to the other. So again, putting away childish things means that we need to put all of these things into a perspective. Um, so we need to mature. Amen. All of us, as we grow in Christ Jesus, we need to take off the old man, amen, and begin to put on the new man. And as we begin to uh, replace the new man, amen, we're going to do so in new different ways. In other words, we want to put new wine in new wineskins, not old wineskins. Verse 13 tells us, and now abide in faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love, amen. Now, Hebrews chapters 11, verse 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, the scripture here says faith, hope, and love. So faith is very, very important. Um, as we grow in Christ and as we learn to walk more and more with him, we need to learn to walk more by faith and not by sight. Amen. As children in Christ, um, we only sometimes base our relationships on tangible things. Amen. Things that we can taste, touch, taste, feel, smell, and see. Um, as long as the baby is being fed, being burped, and being rocked to sleep, then we will see the baby will oftentimes stop crying. Um, likewise, we as human beings, as long as the blessings of the Lord continue to rain down on all of our lives from heaven, then we too will be satisfied just like that baby. 
But on the way to the promised land, as we remember, Moses had to contend with the Hebrew people. And as he was leading them, excuse me, they would complain constantly. They were constantly complaining about food and water. Now, although God had just delivered them from the Egyptians, he had just delivered them from uh, the Red Sea, um, they were still complaining. They were still complaining that they did not have their, need, their needs met at every single moment that they needed to be met. Amen. Now, the Lord, he heard their insistent complaints. He heard them. And he eventually, he granted their request, giving them water and manna from heaven. But then he punished them shortly thereafter. Amen. He punished them thereafter for not having faith in him, regardless of the need. Amen. Now, it's not easy, uh, brothers and sisters, to look at this. And we can oftentimes point fingers at them. Well, uh, Brother John, those Hebrew people, they were foolish. Amen. They were foolish to complain to God after all he had just done for them from Egypt and the Red Sea. How dare they complain? Well, uh, while answering this, yes, they were foolish to tempt God. But we need to ask ourselves, have we done this? Have we done the same things that the people of uh, Israel did at that particular time? Think about this for a moment. Think about all of the Red Seas and the pharaohs, the plantations, the, the wherever it is you were delivered from in your life. Um, after the Lord delivered you from those moments, were there not times where you needed something different in your life? Amen. Perhaps you wanted to get married. Amen. After he just delivered you from a financial situation, now you wanted to get married and you could not find a suitable spouse, which again, nothing wrong with that. But during that time, did we turn around and blame the Lord? Lord, why don't I have the wife that I want? Why don't I have the husband that I want? Why haven't I passed this particular certification? Uh, even though you just brought me from the Red Seas, even though you just helped deliver me from the pharaohs, we now turn to try to question him and his method and his ways. After he just delivered you from a financial situation, now there's something new that you want to buy and you don't have the finances. And then we start praying, asking him why we don't have this big, beautiful home. Amen. After he just prevented the foreclosure from us from getting evicted from our apartments, we now have our eyes set on a big five bedroom, four bathroom, four bedroom home. Amen. Now, in our, in our season of maturation, brothers and sisters, let us not point fingers just at the people of Israel. Let us continue to examine ourselves. Um, he wants us to continue in faith. He wants us not to continue in complaining as a child does when they don't get their way. He wants us to stay and remain steadfast in his promises and in his love. Now, again, we probably say all the time, well, Brother John, what is wrong with wanting to get married? What is wrong with wanting to rise up in our professions? What is wrong with uh, wanting to increase our finances or acquire a few more properties? Uh, didn't you just say that we should all cast our burdens upon the Lord? So shouldn't we come to complain to him? Well, again, nothing is wrong, brothers and sisters, with wanting or needing those things. And yes, we should cast our burdens upon him. That is what he wants us to do. However, in doing so, we should not be murmuring against him. Amen. We should not be murmuring amongst ourselves uh, against the Lord as to why he has not performed the way we wanted to when we wanted him to do so. Amen. There could be a multitude of reasons why you have not been blessed with those things. Amen. Uh, perhaps he's protecting you. Perhaps he is protecting you from that uh, man or woman that you want to marry. Perhaps he is protecting you from that job or that career field that you want to enter in. Perhaps he's protecting you from that particular neighborhood with that beautiful home that you want to live in. We must understand that oftentimes the Lord is protecting us, but oftentimes he's testing us as well. He wants to see whether or not we are going to remember the bridge, amen, the water that he carried us across. He, he wants to see if we remember that Pharaoh, amen, that master that he delivered us from, amen. Let us rest assured in our seasons of wanting. Let us not forget, brothers and sisters, that he tells us constantly, he will withhold no good thing from us. So we are all in a season of wait right now. If we are all in a season of lack, understand that he's doing so for our own good, amen. No one wants what's best for us more than he does. Amen. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Amen. Now, faith and hope are connected. They are conjoined. In order to have faith, you need to have hope. You have to hope for some things. You have to hope for faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, this may sound redundant or repetitious, but many of us are suffering from nothing more than a lack of hope. We have simply given up. Amen. Some of us believe we are doomed. Some of us believe we are doomed to have success in this life because there is no success for us. Some of us believe that this new life in Christ Jesus is not available to us. It is not available to us for many different reasons. Some of us feel that we're not perfect. Amen. Some of us believe that we've made mistakes. Uh, some of us believe that because of the mistakes or the record or the background check that we failed, we are not entitled to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But brothers and sisters, this is, this is far from the truth. Amen. This is nothing but a lie and a deception from the enemy. All of us, all of us have an opportunity to have a, a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. He came 
and lived and died for us. That so whosoever believeth in him, amen, regardless of your denomination, regardless of your politics, regardless of your race, regardless of your gender, amen. He all came so that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Now, maybe you have failed in some ways in life, and maybe you do believe that you are not capable of having anything fortunate. But remember the story of Hannah in the word. Uh, Hannah was a woman who was barren. She could not have children. But through her constant prayers and faith in the Lord, he heard her. He heard her, and he heard her through her hope, amen, and through her faith that there was nothing impossible for God. And instead, she, she was blessed, amen, because of her consistent prayers and belief in the Almighty, amen, she was blessed with a son named Samuel. Uh, let us remember the story of Abraham and Sarah. Because of Abraham's faith and obedience to God by bringing Isaac, amen, his son to the altar, God kept his promise and made Abraham the father of many nations. So brothers and sisters, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And we are no longer children, amen. As we continue to grow, as we continue to age, he expects, expects us rather to trust him more, amen. No matter what we are going through, we need to trust him that much more. Now the enemy will always be there. The enemy will always be there with the critics, including our own mind, which will work against us at times, to whisper in our ears, you're too old, you're too old for success or God has forgotten about you, or he's waited too long, um, or he doesn't care about you, or that you don't deserve to be blessed, or you're not good enough to be blessed. So, but whatever new tactic, uh, brothers and sisters, whatever new lie the enemy is trying to impart on us, we must always remember that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, amen, and to be of great expectations in the Lord. Now, we must abide in love as we continue to uh, mature into the adults, the spiritual adults, as well as the physical adults that the Lord has called us to be. Ultimately, he wants us to put away childish things by learning to abide in love. Now, as adults, again, we must abide in hope, uh, faith, and love. The greatest of these is love. Now, one of the greatest standards we can ever use for ourselves as we continue to grow, again, is to put away childish things, is to constantly be in and abide in a spirit of love. It's very difficult to do so, but nonetheless, this is the standard. And in doing so, loving can make you vulnerable to misuse. It can make you vulnerable to abuse by others, not only by people outside of the church, by people inside as well, by people inside your jobs and outside. But, so what should we do? Uh, what should we do, Brother John, if we find ourselves being used uh, by those who are taking advantage of the love that we are to show based on our belief in Jesus Christ? Well, first and foremost, seek the Lord. Before you do any sort of vengeance or recompense against them, always seek the Lord first. Amen. Now, no matter what gift you have or no matter what measure of it that you have, we must always seek the Lord first. You may have a heart for giving, and that is a good thing. But before you give just to anyone and everything, make sure we seek the Lord first. Amen. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. Amen. We are to seek the Lord first before we engage in any sort of uh, giving in any sort of way so that we can understand that. Uh, our heart is being moved in the right place to make sure that we're not being deceived. We must seek the Lord first before you give away all of your money, all of your time and all of your resources. Amen. Seek him first. Uh, you do not have to feel lost. Amen. In your relationship with Christ. This is why he wants us to walk with him. He wants us to check in with him for all of the things that we engage in, any new ambition, any new goal that we have. Amen. He wants us to check in with him first. Amen. If anyone asks of anything, amen, always go seek the Lord, seek his counsel, first before you engage anything, because he tells us to test the spirit by the spirit, amen, and that we will know them by their fruits. So we are to always seek him first, amen, and all his kingdoms and righteousness and all these things shall be added unto us. So to show love, which is the greatest gift of all, it does not mean we need to just continue to blindly follow whatever anyone is trying to tell us to do or to f blindly follow the gossipers in our lives. Rather, we are to constantly seek the Lord, brothers and sisters. We are constantly uh, to seek him before we give out any and all things that we have because he will direct our path. Amen. After all, he wants and requires us to be first in his life. He wants to be first in your life, brothers and sisters. Remember, God comes first before anything that you desire or anything that you love in this world. Amen. He comes first before your wife. He comes first before your husband. He comes first before your children, before your business ventures, before your ministries, before anything that you are trying to engage in, he comes first. Now, obviously, this includes family and friends as well. So growing and putting away childish things means that we cannot let uh, anything come between us and our relationship with the Lord. We are to seek him first and his counsel first above any and all things. Uh, the word of God is, uh, tells us about King David. Now, David was a man after God's own heart, and even he himself 
would seek the Lord before going to battle. He would always seek the counsel of the Lord before engaging in battle. And if him, a man of his stature, uh, found suit to do so, then all of us should find uh, also to do the same. Amen. It will benefit us as well. Uh, brothers and sisters, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I encourage you to seek one and to have one today. You are invited. Amen. You are all, all of us. We are all invited to commune and to fellowship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Please don't wait until tomorrow. Tomorrow is not guaranteed to no man, woman, and no child. Amen. The time that you have is right now. And you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ right where you are right now. Just believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Amen. And that he came, he lived, he died, and he rose again. Amen. For you, for me, for all of us. Bless his holy name today. Thank you again for joining us for this Thursday's Word of God. Let us all pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, blessed Lord, for bringing us safely, Lord, bringing us safely from all of our places of work and places of communion to be here to receive this word this evening. We just pray, Heavenly Father, over every uh, ear, Heavenly Father, uh, every uh, mouth, every eye that's been able to be attended today. We pray over them. We pray protection over their household today. We want to pray, Lord, for their, your anointing, Lord. We pray for your anointing to cover them from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet. We pray, Heavenly Father, that this message to put away childish things and parts into all of us, Lord. And we pray that you continue the maturation process into each one of us, Lord. Let us not have stones in our hands to cast at anyone's life, Lord, but let a man examine himself. Let us examine ourselves by your word tonight. And we thank you again, Jesus Christ, for your love and your word and your blessed holy name we pray today. Amen, amen, and amen. Thank you again, brothers and sisters, for joining me for this evening's word of God. I am Minister John Pickens, and I hope you all have a very blessed evening. Amen. <laughs>